welcome to the future of sharing it's a new series where we're going to be exploring the key question how can we make the sharing economy work for everyone we're lucky today to have adam Werbach in the studio here with us for an interview glad to be here glad, glad to be here. here and adam is a well known for being an environmentalist uh, he's also a serial entrepreneur and it ties into his latest uh, company he's a co-founder a company called Yurtle, which is in the sharing economy. So he kind of spans uh, both the environmentalism piece and also comes into how it connects to the sharing economy. We're gonna to talk to him about that today. So one of the things about any bio you almost read of you, it says Adam Wareback was the youngest executive director ever of the Sierra Club starting at the age of 23. And when people look at that, including myself included, go, how can you be <laughs> executive director of the Sierra Club at age 23. So just by way of kind of explaining your little, your role in kind of the environmental piece, can you just start from explaining that and kind of give us a little run of kind of what you've been involved in uh, up until recent years here. Sure, I, um, well, I, you know, I've been an environmental activist my entire life. I first got bit when I was uh, just a kid and I brought a petition into school to help oust James Watt and learned at that time when I think I was eight years old that you could do something even though you weren't old enough to vote you could actually make a difference. And that is actually what really kind of made me uh, an environmental activist or a believer that I could make a difference. Whatever it is, I could make a difference. And I really fell in love with this, with this concept that we have a, a very limited set of natural resources that uh, we have on this planet to support now seven and a half billion of us. And my life has been trying to figure out what's the most efficient way for us to turn activism into help for those seven and a half billion people. So you lit I mean, literally, so you, we're in control of that at age 23. Coming yeah. up, was it, I mean, how did you, without getting too deep into it, how did you actually do that? I mean, that's crazy. Um, well, I became the president of the Sierra Club, yeah, right after I graduated college. I had started their student program, what was called the Sierra Student Coalition in mm -hmm. high school. Uh, over the fight to protect the California desert. And this was back in the 90s when we were in a huge battle to protect what became Joshua Tree National Park and Death Valley National Park. Yes. And as a kid, I just went out and mapped the canyons and the slick rock with these great old desert rats and eventually brought the legislation to bear and was kind of fortunate enough to work on that. Anyway, that, that sort of propelled me in the organization because you know they, the Sierra Club, like lots of environmental organizations, were experiencing uh, uh, oldening, <laughs> aging of their, uh, of their population. So finding some student activism was a pretty popular thing at that time. And you know, ultimately for me, it was the question of how do you bring kind of media and technology and some new ideas to a very powerful movement that has done so much at sort of creating our basic laws, our basic protections, the Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, et cetera. But the big question is how does that work in the 21st century? How does that work when you're talking about climate change and economic development? And really, how do you deal with a limited batch of resources and a growing population? And what, what's our solution for that? And that's really what's drawn me into things like the sharing economy, because looking for a solution that's broader than just the, the, the old sort of old school regulatory frameworks that aren't really working anymore, or really not fit to purpose that we have today. Well, another kind of relevant piece of your background that for this conversation is you also had a stint after that kind of more nonprofit and uh, activism, uh, really helping businesses and global businesses really kind of rethink sustainability and scale sustainability. Give, give us a little bit of a sense of what, what you were doing there. Sure. I actually, um, I, I gave a talk asking the question, is environmentalism dead? Um, in the early 2000s, just really questioning whether we were set up to respond to climate change, which is such an existential threat to humanity, but the environmental movement was very much set up for to pass a, a sort of a charismatic piece of legislation. And you know, I was, I was in Kyoto negotiating the, the Kyoto Accords, but even then we knew that, that that wasn't going to work against climate change. We needed a different set of tactics. Anyway, that speech got passed around and eventually ended up in the hands of the board of Walmart. Um, and in a very strange turn of events, they asked me to help them figure out what their sustainability program would be. This is back around 2005. Um, and they made the kind of miraculous commitments to uh, power themselves 100% by clean energy, to sell only green products, and to produce zero waste, which seemed laughable to me at the time. Um, but they were pretty serious about it. So I um, eventually signed on to help consult with them and try to figure out how do you actually train two million employees and buyers from our, across the world to begin to bring these concepts into bear. Uh, so for me, that was a fantastic opportunity to kind of look at scale in a whole different way because you know, Walmart is sort of the White House of the, of, the, of the consumer marketplace. So watching how you could affect buyers and their decisions just by opening up more information and giving people more opportunities. That was it. It's definitely an interesting experience. So you had a stint there kind of in that space. So, so connect it then to your 
understanding or attraction or your awareness of the sharing economy. Can you give us kind of that story because a lot of people are like, the, what started attracting you? What drew you into it and, and kind of why? What were you interested in? Well, that? you know, I, I, the, the opportunity to work with Walmart um, connected me to all sorts of other companies who were then trying to figure out how do we change our products? How do we change our packaging? How do we take toxics out of what we're doing? How do we begin to think about these sort of concepts that have been talked about, you know, in sort of environmental communities, but not, not kind of nationally in that sense? Um, and in that process, you know, part of it was very exciting because we were reinventing lots and lots of products, literally touching every product that was going to get sold at a Walmart. Um, but at the same time, there was something really broken with that because even if you make a product 25% better, if you sell three or four of them, it, you're not helping at all. <laughs> net net, you just produce more waste. And that kept on becoming more troubling because in, in growing consumer markets, people keep on growing, buying more things that they really never use. And that seemed to become a problem that, that wasn't solvable by making a, a better box or changing the ingredients or making a more efficient uh, supply chain. It was really a question of what happens after. And, and that really was the, the beginning of Yertle. Um, Yertle is, a, is a, um, a social marketplace where people post things they're not using, they earn a currency, and they can get anything else they want in the marketplace. Um, it's a way to share your stuff, give away things that you're not using. And you know, it, we have an incredible amount of items that have been formed and, and sent and shipped and then just sit unused. 80% of the things that exist in American homes are used less than once a year. And it's just sort of stunning to think about it. One major retailer, uh, recently told me that one-third of the women's clothing they sell never gets worn. Just never gets worn. The, the waste at the end of the pipe is extraordinary, <laughs> but we tend to not want to harvest it because we're sort of all focused on making more efficient plants or getting you know, renewable energy um, on that side. So the idea behind Yertle was to say, how do we actually solve the other side of the equation? How do we find a way that, that is actually very traditional um, in and, and every culture? How do we find a way to share the things that we have um, rather than just make the things that we're making more efficient? Now just to, to kind of clarify, when you say waste, when people think of waste, saying, oh, in manufacturing, there, there's wasted things and it, we throw it in landfills. You're really be talking about the wasted capacity of the thing or the yeah. use of it. Or something. Yeah, that's right. And, that's and the second you know, way I think of it. Right. And we're familiar with, you know, with car sharing or, or room sharing where you have a car that's sitting in a, in a parking spot and it's just not being used. It's just that, that's a waste. Well, similarly, we have our closets and garages filled with things that are not being used. Only basically technology and motivation hasn't been good enough yet to get people to move these things are roughly worth less than $100 each. Like, How do you get people to get motivated to do it rather than just have them sit there for a long time and then take them to Goodwill or throw them away? And that, that's, sort of, that's the sort of the normal way that people do, deal with things. Um, we see a ton of utility in those closets. Uh, and the question is, how do you actually get those out? I mean, self-storage has grown by a thousand percent in the last 30 years. Exactly. There are television shows called you know, Hoarders and Storage Wars. This is an, um, not just an American phenomenon, but really America is perfecting this concept of just taking things and never using it. You know, you think about it going to a buffet and just filling up your plate and just leaving your plate on this. It, it's just, it, with food waste, we find it disgusting, but the same thing. If you have an old phone that's sitting in your closet for three years, someone could have been using it those three years. If you have five jackets that you haven't worn in a year, people could be wearing those jackets right now. And it, it really is it's a sin or a crime as far as I'm concerned to have wasted stuff that, you know, this amazing technology and resources came to produce and then you just let it sit there. And I understand, I mean, all of us have the junk drawer or the closet, uh, the, garage, the, the drawer in, or the trunk in my, my car for some reason, always on stuff to, to gather stuff. But we need to think about what's, what's a better system to actually get those resources flowing more effectively. So, so just for someone who doesn't understand this, uh, so just Walk us through a little bit more of your deal. So, so basically, you have all this junk in, the, in your in your house. Yeah. Or not junk. Let's say good stuff. How do you do it? You post it into the yeah. System it's very simple. It's you like, take a photo. Um, we sort of auto magically identify what it is. It comes up, and then it's a very liquid marketplace. So most things go in twenty or thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but within within a day, most things are, are gone. Um, and you get sent a posted paid mailing label. You put it on the box, and you send it on. Um, and then you earn what are called Yertle dollars, and you can spend those on anything else on the site. Now, some people just are like, I'm not looking for anything. I just want to get my things out quickly. I want to give them to a person. So if you're shopping on Yertle, it's much, much less expensive than shopping at Goodwill or Salvation Army or anything, because basically we're just passing it directly to people, directly that you just pay uh, uh, the shipping in a small service fee, uh, about a buck per, per item. Um, so you know, for us, 
people tend to like it because it's really efficient for them to move their things. They can really help people by doing it. And you know, it, for those of us who have that ecological bent, it just makes sense to move the things that you have around and to kind of clear out your space and um, be a little more at peace <laughs> with the things that you have. Now you see, like you say, sharing's been a part of culture from forever, basically. But the difference in the sharing economy is it needed the essential interconnectivity and the kind of smartphones. Or tell us why now, and what what because people understand what's going on differently now, and what you're saying. It's really all about the permeation of the smartphones and the. In yeah, I mean, tech, technology and culture, have, you know, are, are, are conspiring to give us a, a, a really um, a, a new way of, of owning and holding things, um, really def redefining the concept of what's mine and what do I actually have to, to have to be able to, um, to, to call something mine or to be able to, be, to use something. I mean, stepping back, humanity uses about 60 billion tons of natural resources to support itself every year hmm. if we talk about coal and iron ore and trees, that's, that's the stuff that we use. We cut it down and we, we can't continue to do it at that, at that pace because there's really just not enough resources on the planet to, survive, to support us as you know, roughly a 10 billion person population, which will be by the year 2100. So knowing that, we have to figure out better ways of distributing the resources around the planet. And this doesn't need to be wealth distribution, this just needs to be a way to make sure that things that are not being used can be used by someone else. Makes, makes sort of good practical sense. What the sharing economy does is it blends together technology and culture to use our resources more effectively. And the technology piece, yes, uh, smartphones and you know, for, for what we do, taking a picture of something and having it on your phone, be able to send it and be done, that's just a game changer, really easy. And that's certainly the case with GPS, um, for car sharing and for identity, through Facebook, a bunch of different tools that actually make that really easy. Um, the cultural side is the other piece that's equally as important. And part of that is, you know, on Yertle, we build a real community of people who like to share, who actually get to know each other, who help, like helping people out. That's a big part of it. Uh, and another part is really understanding that sharing is a cultural phenomenon that's been going on forever. And it's worth us taking a moment to rec realize these aren't like new ideas. This is a very old idea. We're just finding a way to empower it and make it kind of cool again. Great. Now, you are a business. Mm -hmm. um, Without going into the, 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 the yeah. guts of this, how does it work as a business, and why what, isn't it like a nonprofit or something? Just give, give us a sense of the business case for it. Yeah, uh, uh, Yertle is set up as a California benefit corp. Um, it's a mission-driven company, so we have a mission that that uh, to reduce the number of new things we all have to buy by a quarter. Uh, and other than that, it works pretty much like a business in the sense that we have venture capital that's invested in us; they expect a significant return, um, and uh, we operate, uh, will be profitable very soon. We've moved about a million items between people so far. Uh, and the reason we decided not to make it a nonprofit at the time was because access to capital through venture is easier, frankly. Um, and it allowed us to um, get capital that we needed to, to grow the thing non-profitably at the beginning, to recruit engineers who wanted equity as a, as a way of um, uh, compensating themselves. And frankly, to just be in a operating system that's different than the nonprofit world, um, having spent a lot of time in that space, you know, there, there's something really beautiful about the way that technology in Silicon Valley is organizing companies. And I think that clarity applied to a very mission-driven um, uh, uh, effort has been really interesting for us. And given though that people are giving away their things and it's fake dollars, how do, where does the money come from? How does it work? They make it, no, no, they basically, so you post something, um, someone pays the shipping fee, which is roughly $5 for a 10 pound, a, a box of a 10 down, and then they pay a, a, a $1 service fee, and that $1 comes to us. So for every time they, 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 they move something or get something, that gets a dollar to us. Okay, gotcha. Now, you've talked a little bit generally about the environmental benefits, generally the sharing economy. So we're talking a lot to, about cities, the impact on cities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this sharing economy, whether it's house sharing, car sharing, your kind of sharing is, is centering in these cities. How do you see the, how do you, how would you explain the environmental benefit of the, of the sharing economy as, as opposed to the old way of doing things? Well, I'd probably say it is the old way of doing things. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, okay, so to pause for a second, you know, the sharing economy is not Silicon Valley driven. It's not, it's not us and Lyft and Uber. It's that, that's, that's not, what the sharing economy is. The sharing economy is much, much broader than that and connects to a whole set of resources that you and I might call the commons, 
right? The sharing economy includes libraries and courts and roads and, and uh, uh, public access television and the, uh, the, the spectrum. All the things that we actually use as a society to help our society function, both economically and, and, and culturally. Um, we are really interested in this very fast growing part of it, so, but that's not the entire sharing economy. The entire sharing economy, I would say, is probably $15 trillion worth of, of resources. The Silicon Valley sharing economy that we all hear about is probably $150 billion in market cap. You're talking about the American market, all right, it's 15? Uh, yeah, actually, you could probably, uh, yeah, no, I think I'm actually count, counting in Didi Quadi and all, all, the, all the, the global players, too. Mm -hmm. The point is it's small. It's, mm -hmm. it's a tiny fraction of the sharing economy that we sort of see going on from church uh, rummage sales to, um, to bake sales to all the things that actually make our society work. Um, however, those things have been going away and they are on the decline, particularly in the United States in the last 60 or 70 years, in China since the Cultural Revolution, uh, in India in the last decade. Um, we're seeing these cultural sharing behaviors going away in favor of private solutions. So I used to have to take the bus, now I can afford a car, so I'm buying a car. I used to have to drink public water and now I do bottled water. Th these takings of of what were once public space, shared resources, and thought of now as private resources. Because one, you know, basically the Industrial Revolution has made it so cheap to get goods right now, you can, you can do that. And then all the technology and logistics allow those things to be delivered to our door so simply that it just seems ridiculous. It's like more effort. So for example, if I need a toaster, and you know, a friend of mine who lives on the block has a toaster, it is easier for me to get one new from Amazon than it is to go find out which friend of mine has a toaster that, that he's just not using, that's, that's, that's available. And there's also something in my head that says my toaster needs to be new and mine alone. The sort of aseptic um, belief that you know, everything has to be new and perfect before I touch it, um, uh, uh, which, is, which is a little crazy when you think about like a tool. You, you want to use tool if you want a tool to know that your tool is going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we have these sort of cultural barriers that have come on, this need, this, this, what we might call neophilia, this need to have the next new thing. And we have that blended with the, just the rapid reduction in costs of items themselves. And Walmart, for example, has been a big part of that, of just really lowering the cost of items so people could possess them. But now we have the other side of the problem. You know, we spent the, the sort of the beginning of the 20th century um, really focused on scarcity. How do we make sure that everyone has just the basics of what they have? And now we're actually dealing with the, the challenges of too much. And I think that actually in some ways will be the, the 21st the century challenge. That's a great way to think about it. So there's been the kind of American consumerism, there's been this kind of crazy my, my, mind kind of thing driving the economy. And now we've hit these limits essentially, both with climate change and environmental waste. And you're, are you, so you're seeing there's some, some kind of drawing back in. I mean, is that kind of the way you think of it? Like? Yeah, I mean, you, you sort of hear it from people. I mean, it's going to be different. So I want to suggest that the, that the cultural behaviors that we'll undertake now to share are going to be the same as they were before. Um, I mean, something like Facebook, for example, just connects people in a way that's just, they, we've never been connected as a society and as humans. So it'll be different, which is exciting and good. But the same, that, that same sense of, you know, you feel bad when something's wasted. Um, and it feels good to help someone out. Those are just very innate human, human um, truths. Um, and I, I, I can't imagine a world where those don't actually become more prevalent and people tend to sort of solve those problems now that they have tools to do so. Hmm. So, um, okay, there's another piece, other benefits, let's just think hmm. of the, the Sherry economy. We talked a little bit about the environmental things, but just given that human interaction, that's happening through the sharing rather than me just ordering something from Amazon to show up on my door. I mean, do, do you see other kinds of just positive network effects? Yeah, kind of yeah, I, I definitely see that. I mean, so, you know, some communities are doing something as similar, as simple as organizing, you know, group garage sales all on the same day. On, on the same day. So it's just a great, simple track. Just coordinate it, right? So everyone does coordinate. And then everyone comes out and goes to the group garage sale. It's a great neighborhood tactic to bring neighbors together and get to know each other. Um, other neighborhoods are setting up neighborhood tool sheds. There's just, you know, there's just some things that, you know, as much as you might think that you need a pressure washer yourself, you probably need it, you know, a few times a year, just like your neighbor needs a few times a year. Same thing with snowblowers. So neighbors are beginning to figure out tool shed and, and um, solutions like that. Um, there are things like the little free libraries where people are setting on block by block just library shares of, of items. Now all of these are hacking consumption and item consumption in a way that, you know, an Amazon.com 
or Walmart might be selling to people right now. And they're just, they're just hints in terms of what we might see. I think what a city can expect is a lot more of these types of connections and really trying to set itself up as a platform to allow people to interconnect with each other and to find ways to, to pass back and forth things of value. So when you see the cities themselves think of themselves as a platform? Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. So talk more about that, because let's, let's say you're someone who's, you know, aging boomer running a city. Um, how do you do that, or what is that? So explain what a platform is in that, that kind of lingo, the way you describe it. Well, so, I mean, a platform as a city, um, a city as a platform for a sharing economy needs to have several criteria. One has to be open, so anyone has to be able to get into it. And this is really difficult for cities because, um, because of access issues and regulations, we tend to choose a winner um, who is the public advocate, and then everyone else sort of has to work around them. This actually a city has to work and try lots of different folks, big players, little players, and let's see who works, um, as opposed to choosing who's actually going to be the winner. The second, it has to have a language. This needs to actually work for everyone. And, and to understand how that works is partly asking the mayor, the city administrator, to begin talking about how sharing resources is important um, and to encourage it, but really having a language that works that way. And the third thing it actually has to have is uh, a, a communication structure, but some way for the city itself to offer those resources and goods to everyone so it's not just basically an elite or people with money or people who happen to have the right smartphone who can hear about it. And what, what I sort of see in a lot of cities is um, they're open because they haven't been able to regulate it yet. So people are around. Um, they don't really have a language. It, it's not clear whether it's illegal or not legal. People are, are made very uncomfortable with it. But the biggest thing they lack is kind of this communication infrastructure to open up to people who may not have a smartphone what's happening and how they can participate and be engaged. And that really is sort of leaving a lot of people behind. And I think our biggest question is going to be, can, how can this sharing economy be an economy for everyone, not just for kind of those of us who might adopt it first, because we like new things. So let's, yeah, let's talk about that, because there, there is this kind of moment that's happening. So, so when you think about the sharing economy, when do, how, how long have you, when do you date it from, or, or how, in terms of its, its new kind of framework of how we think about it? You know, I tend to see the sharing economy as sort of born out of the, the global financial crisis. It was 2008, 2009 as really the period where it was sort of born. Um, it was bringing together lots of different trends from, from, um, uh, from something like Facebook connecting us through a network to something like the iPhone connecting us with GPS uh, and map technology um, to all sorts of logistics providers from payment systems to um, shipping that actually sort of knit the fabric of it together. Um, and we're in that... I would say we're probably in toddlerhood, not in adolescence yet, where we haven't figured out, you know, uh, what how we will deal with structural power functionally. This is a this is a rebellion, but it's a really big rebellion, um, and it hasn't really taken um, uh, uh, account of itself and really responsibly said, okay, there are, there are reasons why we have hotel taxes, there are reasons why we pay taxes, there are reasons why we have these regulations. Let's, let's be responsible for them and reinvent them instead of we're just gonna break everything down. Hmm. So the rebellion, when you, when you refer to the rebellion, that's, it's kind of the emerging sharing economy right now is kind of a... Yeah, it, I mean, it's rebelling is a status quo that I love. I love libraries, but libraries are being out-competed. You know, I love buses, but they're being out-competed. So that's not a bad thing. We should celebrate when something gets more efficient, particularly when it's provided at a, at, at, with a social benefit. Um, but we need to ensure that that social benefit actually happens, and we need to make sure that people don't get left behind, and we need to make sure that people are open, you know, that, that, that this is not just for the people who can get there first. And that, I, th I think, is our, our biggest challenge as a, uh, if there is a sharing economy movement, it, it is to really say this is open for everyone and not just the first adopters. Do you feel, is there any indication that people within the sharing economy currently using it and benefiting and loving it uh, aren't open to that kind of openness and wouldn't want to share it more or wouldn't want to compromise? Or, or are, are you no, unusual in that way or are you kind of kind of the norm? Well, uh, so you know, we have 850,000 members at Yertle. Um, and I, I've yet to find someone who's not interested in, in sort of sharing this idea and getting, in getting their things out to more people. It's a very open community. And I think that's generally the case among all customers of sharing economy um, uh, applications or uh, companies. Um, in terms of the leadership, I think there's a long way to go. Um, that you know, what we've seen is some companies um, 
uh, I'll mention Airbnb is a company that that's actually it just started too late to to address it was it was deep in its revolution before it got around to understanding that there's going to be implications of the revolution, um, and you know it's done a great job since then to actually try to catch up. But in some ways, the genie was out of the bottle, and that's not just Airbnb. That's that's all the way across the um, kind of the startup world here. Is that there's been such effort at, at starting up that understanding the implications of what's actually happening and going on is taking a little bit longer. And you know we're we're behind society right now. Society is already making a decision here, which is that. From a narrow economic sense, this works well for us, but from a societal sense, it's not very good. And I think that we're going to have to figure out how, that, how we bring those two things together. So what are some of the issues in that societal sense? Uh, can you talk, give a little more texture to what you mean by that? Sure. I mean, the biggest, the, you know, I've alluded to it several times. The biggest thing is, is who, who is this economy for? Um, you know, we, the, 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 the elephant in the room is income inequality in America. And... If something is not serving to lessen income inequality, it will fail. Um, and you know that's that. There's two sides of that. I mean, I'm actually less less concerned with um, ensuring that the that the people who are who are at the top of some of these companies and you know billionaires that that we reduce their income. I'm much more concerned with making sure that everyone can get into these money saving opportunities and save money um, because. Uh, that's just not open for everyone right now. And what, what I mean by open is, do you have a smartphone? Do you have a Facebook account? Do you have a credit card? Uh, you know, do you have a Wi-Fi connection? Um, and can you, can you make all those things work together for you in a way? No, I mean, that is the truth for most Americans. That's just not the case. Um, so, you know, there are smartphones, there are Wi-Fi, but not high-speed broad broadband for many of those folks. They don't have credit cards, or they do, and they're problematic pieces. I mean, there's, there's, there, when you go down the line, there's, there's, you know, tens of millions of Americans who are really locked out of this economy, just like they're locked out of the old economy, and that, that's not acceptable. Um, unless, unless we figure out how to address that, this will just be a, a niche that will, you know, will basically be swallowed up by the old economy, as opposed to being a, a new narrative for how we bring people in. Uh, it'll just be a part of the old one. So there's, a, there's the income economy piece and people like bringing people, let's say, on the, on the periphery or in the bottom of the society kind of in. Um, what about the disruption of the, the, the old players? How, how problematic is that from your point of view or is that just a healthy evolution of the economy? Uh, I think it's going to be very painful. I think there's going to be, a, you know, from the environmental side, we, you know, we sort of watched and I'd say bungled the transition from the fossil fuel economy to the clean energy economy. Um, so, you know, all of us knew the cost to coal miners, and yet those coal miners have suffered a lot in the process. Um, and there was a lot of talk and a lot of conversation, but it was not something we really solved effectively. And, you know, it's you go to some of those coal towns now and they're just devastated. And we're going to see similar employment displacements by the growing sharing economy. Um, you know, it's obvious you can talk about taxi drivers, okay, that's a, that's a change. Um, but, uh, you know, retail is going to have a massive change right now. Um, that's already a change from sort of the digitized economy, but that's going to that's gonna accelerate. And, you know, retail jobs are millions of people in, a, in America today. Um, and you sort of go through industry by industry, there's just going to be a huge amount of change to how we used to work, to how we will work. Uh, and that conversation about jobs and where those next jobs are coming from, that, that I, I think we're, 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 we're barely in the conversation right now. Interesting. Um, what about in kind of, um, there's these issues, you, you alluded to it earlier, but let's just kind of get a little more granular on it. So for example, the 20th century economy, we understood, well, if people are gonna come visit a town, they're gonna be in a hotel, the room has to be, you know, have sprinkler systems if it yeah. some fire breaks out and there's safety things and there's health inspectors. And, you know, there's a system that built up around how do we deal with that 20th century economy, whether it's taxis or hotels or whatever. Where are you, you alluded to this a little bit, but just talk again a little bit more in depth on where we are in that process with the sharing economy. How do, how do we rethink that? How do we start thinking that through in this new, in this new situation? Yeah, I mean, we have a few um, major challenges that we have to solve. I mean, obviously the nature of employment is the big one, right? Are you a contractor or an employee? 
clearly this, this, class, this binary classification is not working. Um, and instead of, of, of sort of arguing which it should be, you know, how do we classify Uber drivers? How do we classify um, you know, people who are working for short, in short-term gigs in that sense? Um, we need to change the classifications. So there's just a, there's just a, a failure of imagination now to, to reinvent work and how it exists. So that, there's a whole classification challenge. Another question is really underneath the, the benefits that those things represent, which is why we're arguing about them. Um, but uh, the idea of having a portable benefit system, a, a stronger social safety net where people can leave a job, take a job, and move much more fluidly between places and still be supported, um, uh, it seems critical. And third, I, I just think, you know, saying that from San Francisco, um, housing um, is going to not be an insignificant challenge directly to the sharing economy, because the cities where this is taking off the most are going to continue to sort of vortex up and become bigger. Um, and if, you know, if you're a small town right now and you haven't begun to do this, do this now, because being a leader here will mean you'll get creative folks coming in sooner to your place. And when you do, you have to figure out your housing challenge early. Because if you don't, you'll find yourself in a city like San Francisco, which becomes rapidly unaffordable to anyone who wants to live here. And this is a terrible thing for, for a, a city or a town. Now, you mentioned some issues, but we also, I think there's some, um, there are many elements that are coming into the uh, burgeoning city kind of problem. I mean, one of the things that we've been doing with this project is realizing that, you know, we're watching for the first time in about 100 years of migration back to cities. Mm -hmm. We're watching a demographic change where young people want to live in cities now, and they're not fleeing to the mm -hmm. suburbs, kind of like the boomers and others uh, of the 20th century. Um, there's a lot of things going on in these cities now that the kind of transition to a kind of 21st century, these urban hubs. Um, the sharing economy gets kind of blamed for some of that, but, but how does that layer into what I think are these larger forces in your opinion? And, and to what extent do you see the sharing economy as, as part of the problem or part of the solution? I'd be curious how you think about that. Well, I mean, the sharing economy should be a solution to our limited resources, including housing. Um, there, the, it, it just makes sense that if you can use housing more efficiently by filling more bed nights with people, um, that's good. Um, the challenge is that it has to fit into a housing plan that fits for everyone, um, and that's what's been lacking. So the, the question is, is, does the instigator of the change, is it, are they responsible for you know, the broken eggs that might happen along with it? Um, and the answer is kinda, yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, uh, you know, as those of us who are in San Francisco, um, as an example, um, are driving more economic development here and more jobs and more people in here, we have to be thinking about the housing stock of the city. And can the sharing economy be a big part of the solution? Absolutely. The challenge, though, is that it, 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 it conflicts with some of our other widely and strongly held beliefs. Um, we like our neighborhoods stay in the character they're in. Um, we like low density housing with big parks. Um, we don't really have those big parks, but we would like to have them. Um, and uh, you know, green spaces. As an environmental activist, you know, we've worked really hard to keep green spaces open, and to do that, you're closing the space for housing. So I think that you know, you're asking me as an environmentalist, you know, do we have to change anything? And the answer is, yeah, on both sides. As an environmental community, we need to figure out how to get much more interested in density. We need to figure out how to talk about San Francisco as a three million person city and get excited about that. And then can the sharing economy in that type of vision be a part of the solution? Absolutely, it'll be critical because we can't just have you know, two times what San Francisco is right now. You're just gonna have you know, 10,000 square foot homes for people who shouldn't be, <laughs> who, couldn't, who, doesn't, who don't need them. Um, but what we do need is a lot more housing. We need people, housing for people when they're, when they're just out of school to come here and, and live and work their first job. You know, we need people who are who are working service jobs to be able to stay here and raise a family here. You know, those are those are like uh, pretty simple asks to actually create. But to do so, we need to create a lot more housing here. Um, will the sharing economy help distribute that housing more effectively? Yes, but we need to agree that we have to create a lot more to do it. Well, you're connected here, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of networks, a lot of folks. Um, how would you kind of gauge the the interest? in that kind of larger solution, that kind of uh, willingness to people tied into the sharing economy to, to compromise their situations, to give more magnanimously, uh, to kind of 
play ball, basically, to kind of work with cities to make this work. What, what's your kind of gut feeling across the industry from what you can see? Um, well, I mean, speaking frankly, I think it's it's improved recently. Um, so uh, I I like a lot of what Airbnb is doing in terms of its policy positioning. Um, I like what Lyft has been doing. I think Uber has been actually changing. Um, I was quite critical of them and their sort of their positioning um, early on, but they have um, they're articulating a lot uh, a strong interest in partnering municipalities to actually you know, provide the last mile of, of service. So I think there's a change going on. Um, we're sort of getting our big boy pants right now and beginning to sort of talk like adults and and understand that these are not we're we're not just a revolution. We're actually part of the system now, and we have to make it does that system work. Um, and I think projects like this are, are absolutely critical to begin a dialogue and particularly to be with civic leaders to give them all the information that we have and to give them all the tools and data and information we have and let them process it and figure out what's in the public interest. Because in the end, that's, that's what our civic leaders and our nonprofits are supposed to do. They're supposed to represent the public interest and be in dialogue with private interests to figure out how that can serve the public interest as well. And unfortunately, there's not been a Walt partner either. So you oh, have a Waltz partner that, oh, that, that where, where there have been sharing economy initiatives or, or individual companies that have tried to do it, it's been hard to find a, a kind of a consistent um, city voice to actually blend that to. So I, I think there's, there's sort of definitely challenges on both sides. Um, so, I mean, there, there, is, there is this kind of sense, there's two things going on here, which is there's a growing number of people and actually like you say middle class people upper middle class people uh younger workers millennial people who are benefiting from the sharing economy liking the sharing economy whether they're either using it or whether they're actually kind of working it uh there's some definitely a kind of constituency that's building yeah so from that positive kind of side i mean you've been watching this like you say from about 2008 i mean are we at this point now is is that starting to get to a critical mass um, or, 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 or in terms of being able to uh, really play a role in politics? Or where would you say that is in that stage in terms of the, the growing constituency for this? Yes, it is getting to a critical mass. Um, so, you know, when you look at the numbers of people who have, you know, in some of these cities have participated in a sharing economy company um, or uh, who have positive feelings towards it, it's pretty significant. So we're, we're seeing a large enough organizable audience um, however, I don't think the companies should be the ones organizing it. I think it should be the cities organizing people who want to share resources because that's what a city is all about. Um, it's sharing common. Yeah. It's sharing common. It's it's actually going to a place where you're going to hear your neighbor when they use the bathroom because you're in an apartment and that's what it's like. Um, you you are very close in cities, so the sharing economy already exists as the way that a city works. Um, and that flag has to get handed back to the cities, or the cities have to take it themselves, and to find a positive, proactive vision for how we will share our resources more effectively. It's not communism, it's just sharing. It's, it's old-fashioned, it's what people want to do, and having civic leaders that ask us to do that will, will make us rise up as citizens, and, as, and we'll also invite the companies who are, who, are, who are advocates in this area to find solutions that will work around the public interest. But to date, the civic dialogue has been, how do we stop this threat to our monopoly or our monopsony? How do we stop that? And, and that's, that's a terrible way to kind of interrelate with innovation. Now, who's saying that stop? Uh, are you saying the cities themselves or some kind of backlash to the change? I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a mix. And again, um, I can talk about this in a more global context. Yeah. Um, but if I want to talk particularly about sort of major cities, and we'll talk about you know, kind of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Barcelona, um, uh, uh, Paris, um, Shanghai, in all those places you have um, pushback from municipal government, from labor, uh, and from um, you know kind of NIMBY oriented um, uh, environmentalists like me. Um, and there has, it's, it's been kind of a dull response, not very effective, but a, 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 uh, a um, droning dull response. And you know, ultimately, the kind of the sharing economy entrepreneurs have just trounced it because it's not been very well organized. Um, but what's going to happen is one of two things. Either it will organize itself very well to sort of stop it all, um, which would be a, just a great loss for humanity, um, or it will organize itself to say, no, the sharing economy is us. 
We are the representative cities. We represent the sharing economy. You are playing in the sharing economy, making it more efficient. You are welcome. But here's where we're going. Here's my expectation of what right, every San Franciscan will have. Here's my, here's my sense of vision of how we're going to improve public transportation for everyone and how you can be a part of it because this is our goal. How, how do we reach it? So having this more expansive vision that says that all the resources we have should be available for everyone to use more effectively, how, how do we do that and how can private uh, companies help us solve those problems? One thing I've been seeing as I get my head more in this project is um, there's clearly a back, there's a growing, swelling kind of, and I'm not just saying people yeah. in the sharing economy, but people using the sharing economy and liking it. And then there's a backlash, clearly yep. you kind of identified it. To me, cities are kind of not here or there, at least, from what I'm kind of seeing. They're kind of trying to figure it out. Um, I mean, I don't know, you seem to think of them as, as more in the kind of, um, not as neutral, but more kind of backlash kind of crew, or how, tell me a little bit more about where you see the, the kind of the city's uh, positioning right now and where they could, where they need to go, basically. Yeah, I mean, I could, in the U.S., I could probably name a dozen, you know, city leaders who are, you know, passionate and powerfully leading forward in conversation dialogue, but I could probably name 50 who are out there with torches trying to burn these companies from their city. Um, space. So, um, I mean, someone else might have their own cor their own count, but no, I think I think a lot of the bureaucracy has responded with a with a very cold shoulder to these new innovations because it, the, you know there's no form for that. There's no there's no model for how it should work, and it's just a it's just complicated and confusing um, to actually figure out how this is going to work. There's no process. It, it it's just complicated. Um, so uh, so entrenched interests want to maintain what their hard-earned wins are. You know, people care that our buses are regulated in a certain way and they want them to stay that way. And it's threatening to watch that that's been changed. Um, you know, for in, in our, uh, in our uh, zone of kind of consumer goods, um, you know, taxes, local taxes are based on people selling new things. And even though it's economically more productive for someone to reuse a laptop that's sitting in your um, drawer, you know, Giving it to a young girl to to uh, take to school is a very economically productive action. There's no that's not counted in the economy anyway. That that's just you know just incidental. Mm -hmm. um, so you know we need to really th rethink a lot of the ways that we count things, the way that we you know regulate them, um, and uh, really establish public goods and expectations for them that are just different. They're just different. So if you had to give some advice. Um, it's almost generic advice going forward. I mean, it seems to me it's it's calling out for some kind of dialogue or some kind of conversation. But do you, do you, what would you just advice that you start to think about if if you were to think the way through here a little bit? Uh, you have any thoughts on what would be useful kind of ways to go forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that the first step is to be open to it, and I, that's that's probably the first, second, and the third step is just to say let's just let's try some things out. Um, and you know, cities have a are can be tend to be very conservative in the sense that they don't want to try something that fails. And that's something that Silicon Valley is very good at doing, failing. Um, and cities need to be willing to willing and able to do that as well. So yeah, try try something out. You know, try out a different platform, try a different partner, try three different ones and see which one works. Um, do it on the side of someone's desk. Um, don't do it through your normal procurement system. Just try something. You know, mm -hmm. try it among uh, you know employees, city employees. Um, try something uh, and try a lot of different things. That's that's honestly the first and most important thing for people to go do. Um, the second thing is to sort of suspend disbelief for a little while um, because uh, um, it it is hard to see some of these things working, um, and yet they are. So suspend your disbelief for a little while and just try it what, out. What do you mean by that? But it's hard to believe. say that again. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, when you imagine that um, you know the the that there are more usable items in most cities' closets and garages than in any Amazon distribution center already. You know, there, there's in virtually every major city in America we could eliminate everyone's need for clothing today. Yeah. No one would ever not have a coat and be cold tonight. You know, we could solve everybody's kitchen 
in America, in any major city itself. They could fill a kitchen up with items that are just sitting wasting. They're with, a, with unused auto parts, you could make every car run. I mean, it, it's, it's just all right there. We just haven't plugged in. So you, it's, it's hard, hard, hard to believe. How would that work? And how can people get there? And is it, you know, is it, it, it's hard and complicated. But the, the, the raw materials are there. We've actually filled up our shops and garages. Those things just haven't been uh, uh, effectively distributed. And that's something that a city should probably be in, involved in doing. And then do you think there's like some kind of another step, next step beyond that? I mean, what, what, I guess, what, what is the role, I guess, for those in the sharing economy? What, 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 what would you see as steps from, from their side, essentially, to kind of move this ball forward? Do you feel magnanimous gestures, kind of openness, trans, I don't know, just ideas that, that you might say that would be kind of well, I think the same, good faith, you know, good, good will. I think I, if, I, if I, the two steps for a city are to be open and try a lot of things and suspend your disbelief, I think probably those same things for those of us in the sharing economy uh, matter too. Um, cities are extraordinary. Um, uh, they're economically very productive, they are societally very productive, and they're important to us. So trusting them and listening and trying to find ways to go through those, you know, in a very different, very different um, organizational styles and trying to implement together is is something really exciting. So, for example, in transport transportation, you know, I've been talking to a couple city managers who are evaluating, you know, changing their their public transit systems to to interoperate with an Uber or a uh, Lyft. I think that's great and super exciting. And they tell me about the challenges they have to do. It's just, I mean, it it is really. Um, Heart, <laughs> and I, I appreciate that. But looking at it coming together like that, that I mean, it's going to be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think it's sort of the same thing. And you have to imagine on the Lyft or the Uber side, it's just so much harder to do that than it is to just get another thousand um, customers through Facebook ads. Um, but I think those are the things that are actually going to be worthwhile in the end. Okay. And um, so, what are you worried about that might screw this? whole thing up. I mean, it, it, all you've talked about the promise, it's how it's growing, it's like the vision ultimately. Um, it feels like there's some kind of moment here there, you can go from the big boy pants of adolescence into adolescence and adulthood. What, any concerns that you have at this moment that what, what could happen? Oh, I, I'm deeply concerned. I mean, I, I, um, I, um, I like that we're talking about the sharing economy here, but I want to acknowledge that it's not widely accepted um, that this should be the term that it's called or that there should be something that that's the case. And that's deeply frustrating to me after, you know, four years or so working on this that, um, no, it's not understood. And in Europe, they call it the circular economy, um, which is about taking the sort of take, make, waste world and making things move more, resources move more effectively, which is sort of connected. Um, but the sharing economy, as we talk about it, which is really a, a you know, a people-facing brand of idea that we're going to share our things more. <laughs> we are going to find ways to share our things more because that's good. Um, that's unique and it's deeply at risk. Um, and you know, if you go to any of the companies who um, who uh, I would define as part of the sharing economy, you look at, at their descriptions of themselves. None of them call themselves part of the sharing economy. There's sort of no there's no benefit to them to do so. Um, it's confusing and not widely understood by people. Um, and there's a lot of negative um, understandings to it too. The sharing economy is seen as uh, uh, as a tool to increase to increase income inequality, not to reduce it right now. So. Um, yeah. You really think that that's the kind of prevailing kind of? I think if you went and asked ten people on the street uh, on Mission Street right now, um, they would all say that. And with the idea being just just walk me through that because it's benefiting a, a yeah. more elite of society. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the probably the more complicated way of saying is that the that the real value in the sharing economy is the growth of the enterprise value, not the customer value. So when um, a company becomes worth $50 billion, the drivers or the customers or the sellers, and whatever you want to describe it, are, are not getting that $50 billion in, in asset value or enterprise value. That's going to the investors and, and managers. And really, the, the people who are doing the work are receiving a wage, but, um, but at that, not, not, not benefits, not a bunch of other things. So it's not necessarily a model for sustainable economic 
vision for people who are working for sharing economy companies. Now, if you talk to them, they have a slightly different story because it's relatively better than the job they had, but it's not necessarily a sustainable solution. So the contract gig economy jobs without having portable benefits, without having a higher minimum wage, without having a few different governmental supports, I don't think is actually a, 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 an economic narrative that we can have to power the 21st century. It's, it might be in the right direction, but it's not all the way there. Got you. But also beyond those kind of big billion dollar valuations, there's a lot of other companies. I mean, you're one of them. Yeah. And for someone that doesn't really understand the space, when you think of that, throw out some other ideas of like areas that are getting kind of permeated now by the, the sharing economy, honestly. I was just talking to Kyle from um, iFixit, which I love. iFixit is a, um, I, uh, they, they basically help you fix anything that you have. So they are crowdsourcing repair guides to everyday things. You can go to iFixit. Um, ifixit.com, and you can find a, a guide to fix anything. And they're working with engineering schools all across the country to help them learn how to fix things and teach other people how to fix things. Which is mm. real simple, right? But again, it's using the power of the internet and technology and crowd power to bring it together. Um, mm. I think that you know, uh, crowdfunding is another good example of that. Uh, that could be from a like Kiva, where you're actually doing revolving loans that help people, or something like Indiegogo or Kickstarter that's helping creative production do. So there, there are lots of different things that all are part of that. Um, I want to see those connect a little more closely to the public library and to the public spectrum and to other pieces of, of our public assets that should be shared more effectively that aren't. So you're worried about the kind of potential, the constraint, but overall, if you looked out five or ten years, what's your best guess of where this is going to go? Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, so I, I hope this will be um, the economic story for the 21st century how we finally figured out that there would be 10 billion people on the planet, that we only had one planet to live on, that all of us need to have food, shelter, and basic human rights, and that the sharing economy was the mechanism by which we actually found enough for everyone on this planet and a way to live. So that, that's, my, that's my hope and aspiration, and it's the best, the best story I've been able to figure out so far. Hmm. Well, let's hope that that is actually going to play itself out in the next... 5, 10, 20, maybe. 20, give it, give it 20. <laughs> You're giving yourself <laughs> But anyhow, it's been great having you here. Okay, thanks. Great conversation and uh, a lot of food for thought. So thanks. Thanks, Peter.